Nigerian Studies for giving me this platform to present my work in detail. And um, so this morning, I'm going to be presenting on the topic that says decolonizing the African communication system and creating language access for the culturally and linguistically marginalized. All right, the video you watched <coughs> is about 2001. Mm. It's about my early encounter when I didn't have, I mean, I was just a young graduate, and that was it for me. So, um, so 2012, I think 11 years after, so my wife and I decided to go back to that school because I had this quest to start um, to study communication disorders, and uh, I was looking at a physical, um, you know, um, people or subjects to study. So my wife is a linguist, um, so you know her. So she helped me to craft my survey, and uh, both of us went together to the, the school to start our work. So this, that was 2012. And uh, so everything I'm going to be talking to you today uh, will be something that started from 2014. Because 2012, we were doing this by ourselves until 2013, yeah, 13, that. Um, we started talking to people and uh, people started responding and then we started meeting parents and then 2014. So my work is informed um, by this uh, information. What? I want you to know that every data that I'm going to be presenting today is from Nigerian deaf community which is applicable to many other African countries. Also, I'd like you to know that most African sign languages are yet to be documented. Also, know that foreign sign language influence exists in many deaf communities in Nigeria and in Africa. Yet, diverse indigenous signing systems are found in many indigenous communities. Then, because I'm presenting two works today, my work with the refugees, which happened in 2018, every data that I'm presenting uh, about the refugees, are particular with um, the non-English speaking African refugees that are in New Mexico, precisely um, Albuquerque. This year, the United Nations declared 2019 the uh, year of international um, uh, International Year of Indigenous Languages. And um, you might also need to know that from next year or at the end of this year, the United Nations is going to declare um, a decade of Indigenous Languages. And um, so I would guess that it is because of the much um, um, in interventions and you know, actions that have been following these uh, declarations since January 2019. So there has been an increased intervention about you know, the revitalization of indigenous sign language, both signed and spoken. And um, so effort towards um, revitalization of colonially marginalized indigenous languages and cultures are on the increase. Um, so for me and so many people who know um, the pathway towards um, revitalizing the indigenous languages, one of the things that mean a lot to us is creating language access, language acquisition for children, um, and then also um, focusing on indigenous knowledge and indigenous language for, for literacy. So for me, it is deaf children and also, um, by extension, the refugees here. So about, you know, it is common sense to know that Deaf people and also the non-English speaking African refugees here in Albuquerque are not, you know, holistically being carried along in whatever um, that is going on right now. So that is my concern, you know, for, for, for my work. All right, so my work is informed by these two prominent um, theoretical framework. Uh, one is child language acquisition theories. Uh, second is early detection, early intervention program. Uh, one of the proponents of early intervention program is Yoshinaga Itano. Um, in, 19, um, in 1989, did a study that, uh, that proves that deaf children um, do not have mental disorders, do not have, or children with disability in general also, do not have um, cognitive uh, disabilities except 
when they are denied language access within age zero to five. And the, so this is a prominent uh, theory uh, for people who are uh, concerned with language um, acquisition that if a child is denied access to language between the first day the child is born till five years of age, that first five years of that child, the child may lack certain essential skills that will impact the child's life throughout you know, adulthood. And so um, I just borrowed this picture from uh, uh, St. Half, as you know, it shows the milestone of child development. So child development is tied to child language um, acquisition, so in all ways. And so that it, yeah, every access to language can lead to you know, uh, the disadvantage of one aspect of the development. So I'm going to be presenting to you two culturally and linguistically marginalized uh, communities. The first is um, Nigerian deaf community, which I tag um, the uh, culturally and uh, linguistically marginalized community one. Um, the second is uh, the refugee community. So if you look there, they are the students that I, you know, I had, had worked with. And this is an exemplary picture of a Nigerian deaf child. Um, so I have been working with a team I, I, I formed, or rather put together, by virtue of speaking to people by virtue of um, being a language activist, and I was talking to people in my church, in my community, in my university, and people started listening to me. In 2013-14, a group of people came together and said, okay, we signed up for this, we're gonna work with you. They are not linguists. In fact, when we started, it was only my wife and I who were linguists, and the rest of the people, except maybe some, one or two of my students then, in Imo State University, and so the rest came from different um, disciplines. But you know, the common uh, interest everybody had was you know, knowing that there is a community of young people that were isolated. Uh, so for whatever it meant to them, um, it, it meant that this is not good and we want to stand up for to it. And so, but this is my current team anyway. This is a picture taken in 2018. The um, lady in the middle is a professor of linguistics. So this picture was taken when we went to document um, the community, and then this was a pre-documentation uh, um, training that happened. Uh, so this, all these, this is a deaf man, and I think there's another deaf boy here. The rest are some like interpreters, linguistic students, and you know people from different um, you know disciplines. So that's my team. I have not really been working alone. And that's why I, I would say that there's much progress in what we've been doing. Okay. So um, I'm going to be discussing three basic um, type of deaf communities in Nigeria. Um, I will start from the middle one, which is the schools for the deaf. Um, if you look at the relationship I created there, there is a very close knitted relationship between the schools for the deaf and the associations of the deaf. And um, there is an upward progression. And um, also down there you see um, urban sign language, or which, which is I mean, what we have called the school sign language. Um, also, you see down there, there is literally no good connection between the indigenous deaf communities and the school for the deaf and the associations of the deaf. So that is to say that these two communities kind of operate um, on, you know, differently or separate of this. Um, this is more or less the isolated community, even though there are some isolations also in relation to these ones. But um, my work started with these two communities, and I'm going to uh, take you through how we progressed in, you know, studying these uh, these communities. Um, so at the base of the map, oh, sorry. At the base of the map, you see the red box there. At the map, that's the map of Nigeria. You see the red box there, the red box which represents Imo State. So the students that you saw that were dancing, we are students of School for the Deaf of Eketa Orodo, which is in Imo State. And um, so there are other two schools, three schools for the deaf in the total. And um, the total population is there about plus minus 800. And there is also a deaf association of over 300 
members as at the time we took their data. So my work generally started in Imo State and um, we went to, um, we first went to, it was Lagos. After doing some intervention work and whatever um, in Imo State and at some point, their, the work we were doing were a little bit um, kind of noised abroad. So we sought approval from the Ministry of Education, Lagos State, and they gave us, and eventually, we happened to know that Lagos had for the three deaf schools. So, but these schools, uh, some of them are Unix, a, a mixture of, um, you know, it's an, a, a mainstream school, whereby you see the hearing students and the deaf students and all together. Then, Lagos State uh, Association of the Deaf, about 1,000 members, as at the time we took their data um, in 2016. So also we got approval to work in Enugu. We took um, the documentation or, or rather demographic data of um, Enugu. We didn't really study the association of the deaf. We were focusing on the schools. And then we came to Abuja in 2007, 2016, uh, where we have three deaf schools. Um, and so in all these schools, we studied a whole lot of things. Like, we made our arms open to take all manner of data we can, you know, much of which I am not presenting here today that have to do with their education, parental commitment or involvement, teachers, school administration, the government policy, all these. We, we kind of um, made out a, a broad uh, spectrum of survey that helped us to understand what is really going on in deaf community. But you know, this presentation today is focused on their language and uh, literacy. Um, so much later, in 2018, that was when we had contact with um, an indigenous deaf community called Mugajingari Deaf Community. <coughs> All right. So looking at the, the communities that we, we studied, we found out that um, three out of four um, children and adults, deaf people became deaf after falling sick. This we found in 2016-17 from all the data we took from all these schools and then the associations, three out of four of them were sick and they became deaf. And we also found out that most learned sign languages or sign language in school for the deaf. Most of them learned sign language in school for the deaf, especially those that live in the urban areas. We found out that deaf people, they are a major minority uh, group in Nigeria and also in some African countries. Because of the, so far, the little knowledge we've had of their population, we can say that, yeah, these people, I know there are some uh, predictions of population. We have not been going by that because right now we are also doing a documentation of their population. So from whatever we found, they are, the population is large and is worthy of you know, uh, study. All right, so um, this was the beginning in 2015 after having spoken with people, what could we do? I didn't have a very firm grip of even what I was to do because I was in the middle of what I didn't know, how I got into it. Um, so, but we needed to have, kind of start with something, but um, going to the school, like the video told you, one of the things we found out was the environment of the school was not very you know, healthy and neat. So, um, their health was a concern to us. So my team, when they gathered, was like, how about we do something um, to see, you know, if we can alleviate some of their health issues and all that. So we carried out the free medical service. But in that, we wanted to look at one particular thing. Because of the story we heard from the principal that um, people from the town or village used to come to vandalize and, you know, also abuse the deaf girl. So we wanted to screen the um, students, especially the female students, of any possible infections and all that. So that's what we were doing here. Um, so we found out that the study we did, about 75% of 145 deaf, um, female students we screened, uh, about 71% of them were having STDs. And um, also up to 70 of, of them, up 70% of them had been sexually abused, some in their homes, some in the schools. So the next thing was we had to call the parents on a meeting of the school to also kind of know their involvement and their knowledge about all these things. 
we found out that none of them really knew this. That confirmed the lack of communication that existed between parents and their um, and their students. So, and because of this knowledge, we said, okay, um, since we are aware of other schools for the deaf, we took this same study in the school for the deaf, Abuja, Kujé, precisely, and it was pretty much similar. The difference between these two schools was the first school we studied was a high school, and so we have grown-ups up to from 12 years up to 25 years old in the high school. And the school we studied here was an elementary stroke middle school in interpretation of the you know um, the school. So um, the population was not that much, but it was still very um, uh, significant presence of um, infections that would have come from either the dirty environment or also um, sexual contacts, maybe, that the same that was happening in the other school. All right, so but as we, you know, were going on, that was not really what I wanted to focus on. So we found out that um, sign language data that we, we, we collected in, in three deaf schools, all schools and students claim that they, that they learned ASL or that they sign ASL. So for me, in my little knowledge that time, it didn't make too much sense to me, even though I know that, or I knew that this <coughs> school, um, the book they were using for um, sign language studies was called The Joy of Signing, and I found out that, you know, they all claimed that that's what they, they used. So at some point in 2016, when we had this study in Abuja, I, we collected, um, 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 Silent with data while others were doing other things. My friend and I, Mary from Ghana, so we were doing this um, data collection. And uh, so we ended up um, uh, using this data collection to kind of compare, you know, what the sign language system, the difference between what they're signing, all the similarities, and what is being used in a typical deaf community in, in America. Um, can you um, tap that for the video to play? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so nice one. <laughs> I leave it to your observation of um, observatory judgment to um, for linguists. If you reconstruct, you know, the signing system, um, you would judge how much um, similarities and differences that we have, which could have been influenced by a lot of factors that we know and other. But this was just our way of trying to understand what was really. Um, going on and um, can we really say yes that um, ASL is, is domiciled in Nigerian deaf community and all that so that was um, our concern. <coughs> Alright so um, in, after that we had to go to the next um, level of the deaf studies <coughs> to collect more data to understand more what is going on. So this is 2017, the demographic data we collected from the um, Deaf Association members. These are adults who must have graduated from school. Um, so here we were concerned about a few things. Here is, it said, um, learn sign language in school, 95%. So the people that we studied all learned sign language in school. Um, uh, except for about 2% of them that said they learned suddenly from friends and their communities. Um, so 75% can sign well, uh, uh, about 9% can sign a little, and 2% um, cannot sign at all. Some of them that became deaf as adults and they've not identified with sign language. Um, so among them, 38% have speech, so which helped us to conclude that they must have been postlingual they became deaf as, as, after five years at least. And so that was the parameter there. Um, so we have don't hear at all because we find it difficult to um, um, <coughs> qualify or quantify whether a person there is profoundly deaf or hard of hearing because of lack of diagnosis. So we can like, okay, do you hear at all? They said, no, I don't hear. So that's the you know, parameter we use. And this said that they hear uh, a little, and um, these uh, percent for something have up to secondary school education. So that also helped us to know the people that we were interacting with, how literate they could be. So this is the uh, data in terms of sign language. We also wanted to know 
what what knowledge or or literacy level of sign language for you know the deaf adults. All right, so out of these studies uh, for these two <coughs> levels of um, deaf, um, deaf uh, communities, we had these conclusions. One, sign language use and deaf attitude towards sign language shows significant evidence of post-colonial impact among the students, the teachers, and the adults. And we also found out that up to 75% of deaf children lack access to sign language from age zero to five and beyond. And this often negatively impacts their cognitive development and academic performance. And this is no different situation in other African countries from what we gathered, at least many that had the presence of, that have the presence of, you know, uh, sign English or English-based sign language as we find it a little bit difficult to really describe what's, you know, going on. So this became something that we, so at this point in, in my study, it was all about, okay, if you know that this is happening in the Urban, urban deaf communities. So, what is happening in the in the indigenous communities? And so, it was something I was looking on to to have um, an experience of a typical indigenous um, deaf community. So, in 2018, we were able to get funding, and we went to this community called Mogadishu Gary Deaf Community. They were so excited that we came to document them, and we had a very good experience of an indigenous deaf community. So Mogadishu Gary Deaf community is in Kaduna North. It's about, it has about 300 deaf signers, mostly adults over 40. We had some of them that were below 40, but there was no child to document. We also had a few bilinguals, those who helped us in <coughs> signing, like this guy was one of our um, language contact interpreter. So he interpreted sometimes, also provided data. He was so good. He was good. So, um, most of them either did not go to school or dropped out of school. So that was also a factor that we were looking at because we were looking at people whose signing system has little or no contact with the urban signing system for us to know what's really going on there. All right, so from, so um, you're still gonna be there. Marketing Gary Deaf Community were able to um, collect these. So before you tap, let me go yes. through this. So we collected 29 bio data. Um, 10 personal and cultural stories, 8 names of things and names of science, 7 cultural games, 5 numerals, like these are videos, sets of videos, and so out of these are sub-sub videos that we collected. 3 times, 3 days, 3 weeks, and month of the days, that's you know the signing for all these. Uh, we collected 2 interrogatives, and um, 2 transportation and movement terms, is that all? Okay, several Swadesh word lists. Um, All right, so let's go to the first video. All right, so um, these are a few collection of the names of um, birds or I mean I items that we collected to also know what. There's a whole lot of large amount of videos of different items that we you know we got. All right, let me talk a little bit about this. Um, I can't remember Monday, but I remember Tuesday is nice to see you. I remember Wednesday is a day we bow to, um, what do they call it in their language? Imam. I remember that Thursday is, let me go back there. Yeah, I think Thursday is a day to beg arms or to appreciate God or something like that. And um, Friday is a day of prayer, and um, Saturday is kind of a day of rest, and Sunday is a day of the cross. That is a sun, um, the Christian religion. So this is um, largely a Muslim community. So um, so they recognize the Christianity and all that. So these were the cultural significances of the signing. But Monday, I don't know why I keep you know forgetting that. All right, so you also see that it was something a little bit different from what our interpreter was you know, signing. So can we get um, to the second video? I don't know if you are the one that did it. All right, so that is, I want to suspend it there for um, my study with the deaf community in Nigeria. So I'm coming to introduce to you my second um, 
um, culturally and linguistically marginalized community too. Um, so looking at the existing policies that affect the refugees that are here, um, the non-English speaking refugees are required to um, have assistance for 90 days, within which time any refugee adult is expected to have settled in and learned English and also have been employed for those who must be employed, 90 days. Um, all educational instructions are in English language, of course, we know that. Oh, okay. So these are two you know, outstanding policies that I think, I know there's all, and, uh, others you know, that affect the non-English speaking um, refugees. Um, so with this in mind, I developed this um, little interest in knowing how the refugees have transited or how do they transit coming here since they don't speak English. But my quest was being informed by the fact that I was wondering if there were deaf people amongst the refugees. So, and how must they have transited? If they had a different sign language and come here, how do they adapt with their own signing system or maybe ASL, you know, something. So if they came from the central east, east central Africa, they must not have maybe had contact with their ASL. So what? How do they really progress? But when I started searching, I searched all around. I couldn't get um, any deaf person. So I decided to settle with the hearing ones. I said, okay, how about the hearing ones? How are they doing and all that? So and we started trying to get the basic data from APS, some of the agents that work with refugees. We didn't really get that. That was something that was peculiar to the study. Like, oh, why is it that people that are working with these um, uh, with the uh, refugees don't really have data, or some of them, is it that they don't want to release it? But I know for sure, APS didn't have data to give us because we were like, I wanted to start from the data. Who are the refugees that come from Africa in Albuquerque, New Mexico? Who are they? So then we, I got into um, this study. So with that at the back of my mind, uh, I was asking this question, to what extent does the refugee cultural and linguistic transition lead to socioeconomic empowerment and contribute to community development? And that was a question that was, you know, to guide my work. Um, so we got basic data from uh, the Refugee Awareness Pro Wellbeing Program that, was, that is being run by uh, Goodkind um, that observed that up to 31% of refugees are coming to New Mexico uh, from Africa. Then, comparatively, uh, we found out, I found out that they have um, the lowest linguistic uh, profile compared to other refugees. I found out that 95% of the African refugees in New Mexico come from non-English speaking countries and so are not literate in English. And uh, two major languages that they speak are Kiswahili and uh, Average family size is between seven to eight compared to other refugees. So um, the method I approached was um, through community engagement outreach, same that you know uh, we use back home in Nigeria for the deaf uh, communities, and then additionally linguistic literacy program which I ran, and I I met some you know wonderful students there. So in all, I visited 20 families, um, one refugee church of over 50 members. Um, average family size is eight, uh, not including those that had extended families. There are some of them that are up to 12, 15. And uh, so African, <coughs> in a normal African culture, they have a, a very knitted, closely knitted relationship that sometimes you come and eat here, you go to your home and, 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 and you know, sleep. So something like that. 85% um, of those families are between uh, first grade and uh, sorry, yeah, and uh, college age. The average number of the 20 participants that were in my class, um, uh, uh, they were average number of 20 participants in the linguistic literature class for up to eight months. I had them for up to eight months, and we had some wonderful um, time together. So, and I taught between age six to 16. <laughs> So it was a funny class for me. Um, so most of them come from Burundi, um, Congo, Uganda, and Tanzania. And most of them have touch with Tanzania in, because they came from the refugee camp. And remember, they were all refugees. They came from camp. Um, so 
many of them have stayed in the U.S. for a minimum of one year. So, and that informed how I was assessing their ability to speak or assess English. So this was my class, reading class, we did more of reading, this is my computer class and computer class. I didn't have a picture of my driver's license class because I taught everything. <laughs> you know? So and um, so <clears throat> in my class I made it, I made them to understand because at the end of the day, before I went into this establishing this class, I also had some interactions with um, some teachers that teach um, ESL. So my um, experience with the students and though that of the teachers we are the same in that the teachers complained that it was frustrating teaching the students and the students complained it was frustrating learning English even after one year in the United States. So I say that I'm going to, okay, in this class, um, initially I started with saying we're going to introduce Pidgin to, you know, to teach English. But I found out that along the line that just about one or two of them came from the West African coast. And so those from the East Central Africa don't speak Pigeon. So I speak a, li a little bit of French, and I don't know any Kiswahili at all. And I said to them, OK, I'm going to teach you English. You will teach me Kiswahili. And um, so that was to give them the room to express themselves in my class. So whenever I say something in English, they, they had the um, privilege of discussing among themselves in, their, in Kiswahili. And someone would tell me, the, the title or the name of that, and I kind of grabbed that and, you know, I repeated it with them, and they repeated English with me, and this was my style, and it was fun for both of us. So, um, my findings in my class included that uh, the fluency level in, in their language was good, they had fluency level, um, but the fluency level in English, next to zero, adults, young children, and all that reading, all of this, because I attended to both mothers and uh, children also. So, but one thing that was spectacular was the frustration that, you know, they expressed. I can remember one of the days I stood out to preach to about eight boys who were high schoolers to come to the class. They were laughing at me that I was inviting them to come and learn English that they are running away from in the classroom. I was like, I looked like a fool. So when I asked the other ones that were coming into my class, and these ones were coming because their parents were bringing them. So they had no choice. Otherwise, they wouldn't have come. When, they, when I met them initially, they were like, they were, they were mute. They couldn't talk to me at all. You know, until I opened up the channel, we had you know, started having some free discussion. I encouraged them to try and speak as much as they could. Now, so having started these two committees, communities, I found out that, you know, some of these things are going round uh, uh, also in relation to the two communities. One, there is migration and there is language contact. For the refugees that came here, have contact with English. For the uh, Nigerian deaf, um, there was, a, the history they know of sign language is the, the um, missionary trip of Andrew Foster who came to teach deaf children English and uh, that was how ASL and sign English were introduced to African um, communities and uh, so a whole lot of deaf people think that is the history of um, sign language for them. So there is language contact um, and this has to some extent have an evidence of linguistic imperialism. For instance, if you look at the, the policy that exists, I mean, you must learn English whether you like it or not. I don't care what you used to speak. And the, So this is kind of creating what I call identity crisis. And also here, linguistic imperialism is the, um, is found when the schools, I will use the word adopted, the, the, the foreign sign language code to be used in schools for the deaf, not caring what happened before a child registers in school. Even, okay, let's take it that, yeah, English is spoken in the country, it is because of English. So, because the general people believe that sign language is a signed version of spoken English. So even if it is the idea of that and not recognizing the indigenous signing system which have been spotted as far back of the 17th century in so many deaf communities in the country and our other, that means a lot. It means linguistic gap, it means cultural gap and for me I target that linguistic imperialism which a whole lot of people are involved in making, um, you know, in sustaining. And if we go by this, um, of course, 
it is going already a possible loss of culture and I, cultural and I, um, linguistic identity. So this is something that is common with these two communities, the NDC and uh, ARC. All right, so what is the global impact to this? Um, continuing lack of sign language access for deaf children leads to um, cognitive deficiencies. And uh, it is not about Nigerian deaf children alone, it's, it's global. Um, for where I come from, there's a, a kind of notion that I would say general to so many people that uh, deaf people are dumb, deaf people are um, um, insane or mental or aggressive, a lot of things that deaf people are tagged with. And from my perspective, deaf people are, are none of these <coughs> except when deaf people, especially those who grew up as deaf children, lacked language access. And it is irrespective of any culture, community, or um, linguistic origin. It is a global impact for me. Possible monotony of language and culture um, leading to the erosion of indigenous cultural values. This is um, what is you know, going on. Um, I have witnessed it in a lot of uh, conferences that I've attended that have to do with indigenous knowledge and indigenous culture and all that. Some school, schools of thought believe that um, erosion, of social, uh, erosion of cultural and language can lead to social vices like drugs, suicide, murder, among teens and youth. Um, uh, and why I agree to this is because I grew up in a community where we have what we call taboos. There are things you don't say. You don't even think of them. You know, they, they, they happen. They don't exist in the world of the children. And uh, some of these things are ingrained and embedded into the folk tales that we hear, into the folk songs, into the folk, you know, different mannerisms, things that attitude, attitude of parents to the children and everything that, hey, you don't say this, you don't even do this, you don't even get involved in this, you don't. So, and when the language that is used to express some of these things are going away, when the culture that, that recognizes these things is going away, what happens? Children take to, or teens take to whatever the you know, current culture gives and whatever. So, much of African countries are still impacted by the post-colonial linguistic imperialism. This is a fact, and um, so this is what it means at a global perspective. So, what must be done? Indigenous African sign language um, system must be decolonized by documenting and developing them for deaf literacy. This is what we realize that could be done, that we want to do. The linguistic and cultural experiences of the African refugees should be incorporated in the ESL program targeting refugees because this is not happening right now and I don't know if it's really possible to happen but this is our expression of opinion that out of the study that you know we did the, if this could be ha could be done there will be a pathway of um, lessening the frustration of ESL people are paid for for teaching ESL and also writing the curriculum but going back to the the progress the impact it has made I think you know, other studies can take over that um, to know how much ESL has helped people that come into this country that are not really speaking English originally. Um, so the education policies in general must be shaped to incorporate indigenous knowledge and uh, promote multilingualism. So going back to Nigerian deaf community, um, having known what could be done, we um, were able to put up this infographic. Um, that talks about how indigenous sign language can be done. We have had a, a, a physical experience of this. So this is indigenous Nigerian sign language documentation project uh, based on technology. Um, this is my team here, and these are deaf signers working with deaf signers and interpreters. This is Nigerian National Association of the Deaf. There has to be a connection, and um, all these working together um, will produce. Um, pedagogical material that will go through legislation and then from legislation to the schools for the deaf, families and um, deaf children that are born tomorrow. Right, so having also established that roadmap, um, we could say after the documentation that we've had in 2018, we have not stopped. We didn't just make all these uh, proposals and then we sit and fold our hands. What are we doing? Currently, there has been increased advocacy through public lectures on um, indigenous sign language. Like um, in, in the past IDSL, which happened in September, we, 
I can say that over 500 people listened to the lecture that we presented in different universities and the ministries of education and ministries of women affairs. So the issue that concerned the deaf people in Nigeria concerned basically two ministries or two government agencies, the, um, the Ministry of Education and then the Ministry of uh, Women Affairs and Social Development. I don't know how that connects anyone. But, so the Ministry of Education takes care of those that are in school. So but beyond school, what happens? Every issue that has to do with disabilities because the deaf people are still included in different disability schemes and all that. So we are targeting these two areas. So in September, we had a public lecture that talks about the rights or the uh, basic right of um, the linguistic right of a Nigerian deaf child, which is sign language. People hadn't heard anything like that before, so but after that lecture, a lot of people signed up also to be part of the intervention. Um, so in the summer, I also taught a class, um, an online class that was made up of over 459 both interpreters, deaf people, and all that. A lot of people was the first time they are hearing that sign language is a human right for the deaf child. That sign language is found in, diff in different deaf communities. That, that deaf children or deaf people develop sign language amongst themselves. A lot of people thought, oh, sign language is ASL. If it's not ASL, it is English. If it is not English, it is American made. And somebody invented it and brought it to us. So that is a very queer language attitude that can kill any language, which is what we wanted to arrest. But we could, I could recount a lot of confession, people that believe they are working in deaf community, that use sign language every day, they didn't know this. So this is a way to um, go in the intervention uh, process that we're mounting. So while that was going on, uh, we took this survey, sign language knowledge uh, survey, amongst the people that had that class. Before that class, I was able to um, has a survey to um, the people that were to take that class. So if you look at the map, the blue, re um, the blue represents before, the red represents after. So before the class, the first question um, that's represented there is, do you support the use of indigenous sign language in deaf schools? Uh, before the class, 17% of those that took the survey said yes, but after the class, it rose to 44. That is a significant amount of you know, knowledge or gap that is being uh, covered. Um, the second question says, deaf children should be taught sign language at home before school. Yeah, pretty much 67 and 68%, um, uh, you know, before and after. Um, next, they should be taught local or uh, indigenous sign language. Also, if you look at it, before the class, they said no, it should be ASL. 26% said yes. Then, after the class, 57% yes, they should be taught local or indigenous sign language. Then, many African deaf children lack early sign language access. So, that is also a common knowledge, both before and after the class. Members of deaf community should help develop indigenous sign language. No, 36% alone said yes. The rest said no, they shouldn't. Why should they do that? Because it's not their language. But after the class, about 48% said yes. We now believe that deaf people should be involved in developing um, indigenous sign languages. So, having gone through all this, we are um, at this point. I didn't even know how to conclude because it's just it's just huge. It's been so huge, and um, the whole experience is overwhelming. But we can uh, talk about. It is in a few words. I say one, African language and communication systems are no doubt influenced by colonial paradigms, especially sign languages, of course. Um, linguistic scholars know that a lot. Many sign languages are totally, totally endangered. So um, both deaf and African, uh, in Africa and uh, refugees in America are examples of culturally and linguistically marginalized groups. That's what my study found and more in-depth studies and advocacy are needed in this area of study. Um, more linguists, deaf individuals, and sign language interpreters should develop interest in sign language linguistics. I would say that, I would say this, that at the point of my study, um, I wasn't well understood by indigenous <coughs> linguists, neither was I understood by sign language interpreters, or was I understood by deaf people. So I was like a bath in my culture that's the bath is significant of a person who is neither here nor there. So I didn't belong to anywhere because one, 
um, indigenous linguists, there's no university that offers a language linguistics or any related course, so it was like, where is it coming from and what is it doing? So for sign language interpreters, I'm not, I'm not one of them, I don't even sign, and so it was like, oh, where is it, what is it telling us? Who tells him that he knows sign language and all that? And then for deaf people, after all, he's not deaf, his family, nobody is deaf and all that. So you could imagine the situation I brought myself into. But, so far so good, I would say we have broken a lot of genes. Earlier this year, we had the privilege of signing an MOU with Nigerian National Association of the Deaf to work on the documentation project. And uh, that um, um, MOU uh, raised a steering committee that is still helping to work on that project right now. So with the um, videos that we've collected so far, we want to go into the next stage of trying to analyze and begin to elicit and know what is going to go into the pedagogy, um, pedagogical material and all that. So we're still doing more documentation because one of the questions that we always face is that, okay, Nigeria has over 500 spoken languages. Which sign language are you going to document? <laughs> so even deaf people, sign language interpreters, they ask this question. Which sign language are you going to document? A question that is informed by the, by the notion that sign language is a sign version of what? Spoken language. And so it's a question that you will not even be able to answer if you are familiar with Nigerian linguistic um, uh, setting, if you are not aware of this fact that sign language is not a sign version of what spoken language is a language that grows amongst the people irrespective of the presence of spoken language in any form. We realize the fact that spoken languages influence sign languages, but that doesn't mean that, okay, just like you have American sign language, it is based on English, which is what a lot of people, you know, did not know. So right now, the next group of people, I mean, linguists are coming to understand that, okay, this is also, even though it's not a mainstream linguistic um, um, area of research, but this is something that needs to be done in relation to what we are seeing in linguistic erosion and cultural erosion in the presence of um, foreign languages. So the next group of people that have not come to terms as a body, not as individuals, are the sign language world interpreters. And one of the reasons is, in my country, basically, all sign language interpreters are people who didn't have a degree in signing. You know, uh, if you look at um, um, interpreting as a profession, it's a profession that you need to study for you to certify and all that. So a good number of interpreters are either coders or people, or people whose children, um, brother or sister became deaf and they picked sign language and they became good and they started signing. Others are those who learn sign language maybe in their church or in their other religious you know, groups and they became kind of good signers. And uh, so they, some of them are intimidated by the fact that even it doesn't matter how much you know how to sign, you're required to get certified. And uh, for you to get certified, you are going to be trained by a linguist or rather at least a sign linguist or somebody who knows um, uh, what it means to um, take you through that pathway. So these are the people that we are appealing to, to come to terms. And why are we doing this? If we're able to get these three groups together to work together towards the development of indigenous science, in the next few years, we know we are gonna produce a very wonderful, formidable um, pedagogical uh, material that the deaf children are gonna benefit from. And so that is our so documenting indigenous sign language requires more funds and collaborative effort, which always, if you are in the research, you know that that does not always happen. <laughs> so, and um, today I want to acknowledge my department of Africana Studies, Team Ezeli, Nigerian National Association of the Deaf, First Love Assembly, my church where I set up my work, ministries of education that have given us a lot of um, permissions to do the work we Office of Diversity and Inclusion that supported my work with African refugees here. I've been done a funding was in you know, a card. And uh, so I'm grateful to you all. Thank you for coming to listen to me. <laughs> all right, I think we still have time over all the time. So questions. Questions. Do you hear me?
your work, I understand that many of the children uh, who are deaf in Nigeria were born hearing, but early childhood diseases uh, led to hearing loss. How does that differ, that you can actually hear and maybe begin to even speak, but then you lose your hearing? Is that even a more difficult transition for the children? Is it more difficult? Or are there differences in I think it's more difficult to be born deaf. Okay. I mean, if I look at it from my part of the study I've done is what is happening in the deaf communities. And there's one little article I wrote recently to talk about the marginalized of the marginalized. So I try to look into what's going in, in going on in the deaf community. I found out that there is a marginalization of the deaf amongst the deaf. Virtually every job that you hear that a deaf person is doing in the government or even entrepreneurship or something is done by a deaf person who is capable of either hearing or even speaking or a deaf person who must have had his or her life amongst the hearing people and has this influence. So those that are really, really um, vulnerable are those that were born deaf or kind of, you know, that never experienced hearing and speaking. That's my understanding. Okay, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, my questions we have to go to was a um, Nigerian context. Um, fine, in Nigeria we have different languages, even without sign, like languages that we speak. <coughs> now we now have it over, I think, over 500? That's what they say. Okay, over 500 sign languages. No, spoken language. Okay, spoken language itself. So, um, but I think there are differences in the sign languages in Nigeria, like what I'm saying, there was a video you were showing, like from the indigenous, the one um, in Cardinal North, and the general uh, sign language in Nigeria. So um, how do you intend to, um, and probably there are also some undiscovered indigenous sign languages in Nigeria. So. Uh, by the virtue of discovering them, how do you intend to bring them together, like match them together to have uh, one distinct sign language in Nigeria? So that would have probably that would not be the indigenous, like something unique to the Nigerian context. And uh, the other question, I I don't know. Let me just say it all. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. The next one is that um, I'm a Nigerian and. Um, I've seen a lot of stuff like what you're trying to say. Maybe not a lot, but I've seen some. <laughs> uh, I noticed that parents that have deaf children tends not to bring out their child out to learn the language because of the stigmatization that could have occurred during the process. So do you have a research in this area in which you are trying to like encourage people, parents, families with deaf children to uh, bring out their children so that the children could learn and um, be of good virtue to themselves, to the community and to the country. I will start from your second, which is that uh, that's one of the things we found out in the beginning. Because initially, as we started, as soon as we had the contact with the schools, the next target population was the parents. We, as early as 2013, when I just had a team, a group of people that came together, we invited the parents to come. And from there, one of the things we were pursuing was to form a, a, a parental body that would stand in for their deaf students and be able to advocate for them, especially those who were still younger in schools before they grow up. But Today, that was 2013, 2019, I can tell you that standing here, parents are the, one of the most difficult, you know, segment of people to deal with in this intervention. One of the most difficult. We've tried everything. I have had to um, open up a WhatsApp group for parents in Abuja to start working and communicating so that we can be educating them on the issues of deafness and their children in school and everything. That was when after, so in Imo State we formed a parental body called um, Deaf, Parent, Deaf Children Parental Care Initiative or something like that, DCPC. I was willing to, out of my pocket, to help them register as an association. 
between uh, one or two, three, four months, they all you know started going back. None of them was coming again. And we tried it in Abuja. It started happening. By the time I, as this time I was coming from the United States, going back to do my work. By the time I leave, they will leave, and that was it. So each one of them was. At some point, I found out that in Lagos, each one of them was looking at me and the work, and my team as we were coming to bring physical aid, mm. especially hearing aid and possible funding on something. So this was a conclusion of their expectation. So when it wasn't forthcoming, they get discouraged and that was it. So talking about sign language and learning and everything, it doesn't concern them. Of course, you say that parents, many of them don't want their children to learn sign language because a good number of them come from the knowledge or notion that if you allow them to go to deaf school, they will lose their chances of hearing because there was still that something. We are very religious. Every church will tell you that your child will hear. Mm -hmm. And those who will go out of the church to the native doctors will also tell you that your child will do what? Okay. Hear. The doctors will tell you, oh, your child can hear. And uh, if you can try and get the, um, the aid, the hearing aid or cochlear implant, he, he will hear and all that. So this surrounds the parents. I blame them to some extent. Some extent, I don't blame them. The, the society is designed to inform them that their child is supposed to be they should intervene for their child by wanting their child to hear, making them to, you know, giving them the opportunity to hear rather than being deaf. Of course, you know, being deaf is not a very wonderful thing amongst parents and community. So that is, uh, you know, for um, your second question. So about the first question, um, like I said, this signing system should have little or nothing to do with the spoken system if we have an organized deaf community where the deaf children are given access or given the privilege of generating language. For instance, the indigenous people that we documented, many of them didn't go to school, but they sign and communicate in linguistics who have phonology, morphology, syntax. They, their language has all this. They have a good syntax. They communicate with everything that they wanted to say through their hands. I mean, if it comes to words, they apply gestures, which are all part of signing at the end of the day. So long as there is communication, amongst them and these communities exist and they have been there as we are founded um, as far back as the 17th centuries when we used to have the mother's vineyard in the United States, the Adomorobe uh, village in uh, Ghana and so many other you know, indigenous you know, villages that used to have very strong developed sign language system. Now what we realize also that the world federation of the deaf does not subscribe to, or rather, does not necessarily support um, marginalizing sign languages to create one standard sign language. So, in our documentation, we leave it open. We documented a community in uh, Kaduna North. The next will come to um, the West and document. If we have a community in the East, we document. What we want to do, we create a pedagogy that is going to include and incorporate all these signing systems. After all, in my language, in your language, we have many ways to say one thing, right? Sure. Good. So those things could be dialects of the same language, or they could be synonyms in terms of lexical items or whatever. Any way you want to do it, it is going to serve Nigeria as an entity to have a, 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 um, a material that incorporates sign languages that we have, so that a deaf child from the southeast can learn what a deaf child in the north will sign and all that. Especially also because of the fact that if you look at physical items that exist culturally, Nigeria as a cultural entity. There are lots of things, say um, trees, fruits, food, that exist in the north that don't exist in the west or in the south. So if I expect to, for instance, have the name of dates, all of you know dates, in Nigerian language house, they call it Debino or something like that. I don't have a name for it in my language. So if I want to include the signing for Debino in, in the typical Nigerian sign language, where will it come from? The north where they have a, a term for it. And if I want to look for who will give me that term, I will go for the deaf who is in the north, and then I will, I will document that and include. And the deaf in the east will now know what Debino is and how it is being signed. Because they know Debino, because it's been brought to the east, but they don't know the name um, culturally. I don't know if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for a very interesting talk, and I, I find the parallels that you've drawn between 
um, how English has been imposed in many indigenous spoken language contexts and how ASL has been imposed in many sign language contexts. It's really an interesting parallel. So what I'm wondering is, in the Nigerian context, whether parents uh, see the indigenous spoken languages as something to be cherished and valued, and whether there are you know, already ways of incorporating those languages, supporting those languages, and you know, trying to protect them from being taken over by English, and whether any of those kinds of um, you know, programs that are already in place that people are familiar with would be <coughs> amenable to being applied in the sign language context. Parents have not been the very good proponents of anything indigenous, <laughs> fortunately. Unfortunately, I will say that. Um, but like the conference I attended in Purdue Fort Wayne is, is a conference of indigenous sign language, indigenous languages rather. So I had some of my colleagues back from Nigeria and also another colleague from Cameroon, three of whom presented their work on policy in support of indigenous knowledge, indigenous education and language and all that. So, they all talked about policy. So in terms of Nigeria as a, a multilingual nation, the policy has not favored indigenous so much, even though these policies <laughs> exist, but implementation has been one of the major, major problems. And there is a proliferation of private schools. That's another problem that we're having. Private schools are owned by people who may have had um, contact with let's say bourgeoisie's lifestyle, elite lifestyle, Englishman lifestyle, they come back and you know, establish um, private schools to help alleviate the um, lacks that we experience in the public schools. What do they do? English is compulsory. The same thing that happened many, many years ago where children were being punished for speaking their languages in school, such private schools still practice those um, things right now whereby you see they can learn English, learn French, learn, learn Spanish, learn uh, Japan or whatever, Japanese or whatever, but no emphasis is laid on indigenous languages. So it is across the board. Um, the, the parents have not really been very good advocates for indigenous experience at all. Even though if you meet them in parental gathering, they will regret all of those. <laughs>